to the virtual broadcast of the St. James Baptist Church. This is a church where God is exalted, the name of Jesus lifted, and the body of Christ is edified. This is the first Sunday in the month of December and the second Sunday of Advent. We will now have scripture and prayer by Reverend Yvette Wadi. Good morning. Today's Old Testament scripture will be taken from Isaiah 40, verses 1 through 11, and the New Testament from 2 Peter, chapter 3, verses 8 through 15a. I will be reading from the New Revised Standard Version, and it reads as follows. Comfort, O oh comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, and cry to her that she has served her term, that her penalty is paid, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all people shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I say, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, when the breath of the Lord blows upon it, surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Get you up to a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good tidings. Lift up your voice with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good tidings. Lift it up, do not fear, Say to the cities of Judah, here is your God. See the Lord God comes with might and his arm rules for him. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and gently lead the mother sheep. The ends of the reading, the New Testament reading. But do not ignore this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like one day. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some think of slowness, but is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but all to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a loud noise, and the elements will be dissolved with fire, and the earth and everything that is done on it will be disclosed. Since all these things are to be dissolved in this way, what sort of persons ought you to be in leading lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for the hastening, the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set ablaze and dissolved, and the elements will melt with fire. But in accordance with his promise, we wait for the new heavens and a new earth, where righteousness is at home. Therefore, beloved, while you are waiting for these things, strive to be found by him at peace, without spot or blemish, and regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, so also our beloved brother Paul, who wrote to you according to the wisdom given him. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. Let us pray. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me, Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on your people. For God, you are a spirit, and those that worship you must worship you in spirit and in truth. We come before you giving you thanks 
for who you are and what you are. We thank you for all that you've done and we thank you for what you are doing. Father God, we ask that you forgive our sins and that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness, that you would be with those who are sick and shut in, and that you would give an oil of joy and a garment of praise to those who are grieving the loss of their loved ones. Father, make us strong where we are weak and give us teachable spirits. As the man of God prepares to bring a word from you, we ask God that you would help us to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. In Jesus' name, amen. After this sermonic selection, the next voice you will hear will be that of our pastor, the Reverend Dr. James Abrams, Jr., as he comes to us with a sermon topic entitled, The Beginning of the Gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Church, the church where God is exalted, the name of Jesus lifted, and the body of Christ edified. We thank you again so kindly for joining us this morning to worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this day, for this is the day that you have made and become rejoicing in it. And on this first Sunday, as we celebrate life and celebrate Christ, celebrate the Lord's Supper, and celebrate Advent. He has your blessing upon us as we worship you, as we glorify you. We pray, O Heavenly Father, that you will speak to us in clear and clarion tone, that we might realize and recognize your holy presence, not only in this place, but wherever we are assembled. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This morning, beloved, I'm going to talk to you from the gospel is penned by Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The gospel is penned by Mark, chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. And I shall be reading from the New Revised Standard Version. And the text reads on this wise, The beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in the prophet Isaiah, 
See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole of Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandal. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. The end of the reading. I want to preach this morning from the subject, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ the Son of God, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now imagine yourself a kindergarten teacher who gathers a group of wide-eyed five and six-year-olds onto the square of carpeting in the classroom that's reserved for story time. You smile into the innocent faces and you begin your story. Once upon a time, a little girl named Goldilocks was fast asleep in a lovely little bed, a bed that she thought was just right for her. But one morning, as she opened her eyes and prepared to stretch out her arms to help herself wake up. She was scared half to death to see three bears staring at her. So even though she was still in her pajamas, Goldilocks jumped out of bed, ran out of the house, and then went on to start having a real adventure as she tried to find her way back home through a thick and dreadful forest. Now, were you to do this, the faces of those innocent little kindergartners would no doubt quickly darken as scowls would come upon their lips, and even young brows would furrow. Any number of them would quickly jump all over you to say, that's not where the story begins. That doesn't make any sense to tell it that way. You have to start at the beginning with porridge that's too hot and all that stuff. Start over, teacher. Start at the real beginning. And you know, kids can be unforgiving when you change a well-loved story, even slight changes earn a child's eye. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That's where Mark starts his story. And before we've even had time to figure out what that opening line means, Mark takes us farther back into the past to the words of a dusty old prophet named Isaiah from centuries and centuries earlier. And in this Advent season, not a few people would want to object as vigorously as any five-year-old hearing a fractured version of Goldilocks and the three bears. That's not the beginning of the story. That's not even fitting for this season. 
Come on, Mark, go back, get back to angels and shepherds and stars and stables and mangers and, and all that good stuff. This is Advent, not Epiphany. It's Christmas for Pete's sake. And the last place we want to be in December is in the middle of some dry, dusty wilderness where someone is screaming at us about our sins. Now, were we able to say that to Mark? He's likely to be nonpleasant. That is, he would be surprised and confused so much that he would be unsure of how to react. Mark is, after all, the one evangelist in the New Testament who is forever in a hurry to get the story of Jesus told. He writes at a breakneck clip, motoring along his narrative through his favorite little Greek adverb, euthus, meaning immediately. Everything in Mark happens immediately, right now, fast. There's no time for narrative niceties and no time to lose. The greatest story ever told needs to be told and tell it, Mark will. Mark knows that we must begin in the wilderness. And as we close out this difficult and in his own way this horrendous year 2020, maybe we need less convincing than in other years that we need to face this world's brokenness head on. The fallenness of this world, our mutual investment in sin, our human ability to wound one another and to divide over things that ought not be controversial, much less divisive, all of this and more has been on grim display in the year 2020. In the wilderness, we've been tried, tested, and tempted by evil to react and not respond. For too many times, we have given voice to what is debased in us. Yes, we must begin with getting baptized because if we are not willing to meet the Savior with repentance in hand, then we may not find any motivation to greet the Savior at all. Mark knows that Jesus came for but one reason, to liberate the cosmos from its bondage to sin and decay. If you have no interest in seeing your own complicity in all that, then you have no more use for Jesus showing up in your life than you would for a plumber who showed up on your porch to the best of your knowledge for a problem you didn't realize that you had. In such situations, there's really nothing to do other than to tell the kind of plumber he can move on. But Mark's beginning means something else. It means that at the end of the Advent day, all the stuff we want to constitute the real beginning of the story, the stuff that is to us what the two hot porridge was to the three bears, is not the core of the story after all. So yes, Mary, you can tell the story of Jesus without Bethlehem's storm. If Mark were the only gospel we possessed in the church, a great deal of what fills up our imagination in the month of December would disappear. But the one thing that would not disappear would be the gospel, the core of which is recognizing Jesus as the one sent from God to save us 
from our sins. Now, of course, in God's good providence, Mark is not our only gospel. We have three other wonderfully composed portraits of Jesus that round out the picture of our Lord, and that's a profoundly good thing. And since two of those other gospels, and one in particular, tell us a lot about the birth of Jesus, it is fitting and fine to note that and to celebrate it. But if we forget what Mark taught us, if we forget what the real core of it all is, well then, the gospel story for us is finally no more meaningful than, well, than a fanciful tale about talking bears and an overly curious little girl. Glory to God, my brothers and my sisters, is Advent, and it is my hope and prayer that we will always remember, always be mindful that Jesus is the reason for the season. Yet, the gospel, the euangelion, the good news, about Jesus Christ is greater than the season. It's Advent, the beginning of the new church year. We reset the ecclesiastical clock and bring everything back to the starting line as the Son of God becomes flesh and gets born into this world. It is the one time when the rest of the world at least vaguely tracks our theological and spiritual location in the church. You can pass through the whole of Epiphany without ever hearing an Epiphany hymn being played on a department store's music. And the season of Easter time is for most people a one-day event marked by a ham dinner or something of the likes. But mostly and in most seasons of the church year, people outside of the church have no idea what we are thinking about or singing inside the church. Advent, Advent is different. True, no one calls it Advent in the wider society. The whole shebang from slightly before Thanksgiving in the U.S. to around New Year's Day is generically called Christmas. But at least people have the basic nerve of understanding of what we are doing in worship across four or five Sundays. If someone who had not gone to church in 50 years were to slide into a pew somewhere in December, he or she would not be the least bit surprised to hear what scripture readings were being proffered and what music was being played and sung. But for all the attention, the world, and let's just admit, also the church, gives to Advent and Christmas and all that goes along with this season, Mark is here to remind us that even all of that is not really the beginning of the gospel. The Christmas story is not the beginning. It's just a tiny piece of the entire gospel, which is itself in its entirety only the beginning. Only the beginning of a cosmic tale so vast we'll never comprehend it but can only let ourselves get gracefully and delightfully caught up in it all. Advent, on this second Sunday of Advent, we light the second candle, the candle of faith. Faith is our response to hearing the gospel, the good news about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Christ, our Savior, who has come to save us 
from our sins. Christ, the Messiah, the Anointed One, who has come to utterly redeem us and reconcile us first to God, to ourselves, and then to one another. Christ, our healer. And it is through our faith response that we experience God's amazing grace. For we are all saved by grace through faith. It not of work that we might boast, but it is the gift of God. For God's grace is greater than our sins. From the wilderness to the city to Calvary to Gethsemane to Bethany, God's grace is greater than our sins. And today on this second Sunday of Advent, as we wait with an anxious expectancy of the coming of the Lord, we say to God be the glory for the great things he has done. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Consecrate these afresh. If there's anything that would keep us from eating 
together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we ask for forgiveness of those things. As we eat and drink, O oh Lord God, we call to remembrance what you did for us on Calvary. As we eat and drink, we think on what you're doing for us in the midst of this perilous time. As we eat and drink, we look forward to eating in the new Jerusalem with an anxious expectancy. Let this bread, let this wine be food and fuel for our bodies, minds, hearts, and spirits as we continue to glorify you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Drink ye all of it. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy communion. We ask your blessing upon the whole church as we continue to be about your business, your agenda. Bless us that we might glorify you in all that we do. And now in the grace and peace of the Most High God, sweet communion of his Holy Spirit, rest rule the Bible with each and every one of you henceforth, now and forevermore. Let us all say amen. Remain in peace and serve the Lord. Thank you for watching. You may continue to watch our worship services via our church's website, or you can watch us on Facebook, where we encourage you to leave comments regarding today's message, share the video with family members or friends, or even start your own watch party. Please remember to join us on December the 9th at the hour of 7 p.m. via Facebook Live for Bible study. Thank you to those that continue to give faithfully to this ministry despite these trying economic times. If you would like to give, please send your check or money order to the St. James Baptist Church. Or you can give online through our church's website using Givelify. To learn how, please watch this short video. Givelify is giving simplified. Givelify is the simplest, most beautiful way to give and track donations to the place of worship or charity of your choice. You're not limited to the cash you have on hand. There's no need to write checks, and there are no complicated forms to fill out or text message codes to remember. Givelify automatically pinpoints your location and intelligently identifies the fundraiser, worship service, or conference you're attending without the need to search. Since Givelify automatically detects where you are, making a donation can be completed in as few as three taps. Tap 1. Use one of the pre-configured denominations to choose your donation amount. Tap 2. Select the campaign to which you'd like to contribute. Tap 3. With your stored credit or debit card, complete your donation in one tap and get an immediate donation receipt. Setting up recurring giving is a simple two-tap process. Tap the frequency you'd like and you'll never forget to make your gift. Givelify lets you easily see your complete donation history. Mark the place of worship you normally attend as your home for quick one-tap access. Givelify. Tap. Give. Done.